Again, I want to express our appreciation for your prayers for us. It has been a long year, uh, but it hasn't been an inactive year. Um, I, I got to say that the great worker for our mission throughout this past year was my wife, who's writing, or rather typing, transcribing uh, the 40 classes that I have taught in Africa because the schools over there have asked me to put them in books and put them in their libraries. So that means for 40 classes, about 30 hours of teaching time that my wife is now typing through. Pray for her. We do have a table out there in the foyer, and we would be interested in having you visit us and, and answer any questions you might have. There are two great and unsurpassable privileges that God has afforded to mankind throughout history. The first is to be called a child of God. And the second is to be a servant of God. To be a child of God, uh, we all are aware, involves accepting God's provision for salvation uh, through blood sacrifice which he completed for all time when Christ died on the cross for our sins and I pray that you have made that decision my focus this morning is not on that challenge but it is the most important challenge that anyone could have to accept that great privilege to be called a child of God we, we were singing that last song. I, I'm, I'm getting kind of sensitive in my old age. I practically break out into weeping when I just hear us praise God. And, and to think of the fact that we, you and I, who have accepted Christ as our Savior, we're God's children. That just, it staggers me. It literally staggers me. The second great privilege that cannot be surpassed by any privilege other than salvation itself is to serve God and I got to tell you that when you take just the word serve God or phrase serving God and look at all the references in scripture there's about there's over 50 with just those words and and literally hundreds more that imply that God's people are called to serve him not just those who are pastors and evangelists and teachers, uh, the gifts that God has given to churches, but those who have come to know Christ as Savior, each one has at least one spiritual gift mm -hmm. to serve God in. And we have the privilege, and it, it, would, it would be a wonderful blessing to go through every one of the more than 50 texts of scripture that talk about God's people serving him. But that would be a very long uh, study. The text that was read this morning, Luke chapter 10, basically is a condensed single passage that reflects simply all the ministry uh, principles for serving God consistent through the scriptures. And so I want to share that text with you this morning, uh, recognizing, and we are, you there? Wow, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, recognizing the 10 basic principles for serving God. Now, I, I cannot offer, due to a limited time, a great explanation of each, but they're worth listening to and going back and studying yourself. And at the end of this study, there will be a, a an email address for myself that if you want to get a copy of this study that I'm actually expanding, uh, just email me with the word study. Serving Christ involves, next slide, first of all, the principle of vulnerability, which in terms of our response, our call, it, it is a call to be wise. He says in Luke chapter 10, verse 3, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. The language itself really explains the implications that are there. 
we need to be wise enough to realize that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. When you come to know Christ as your Savior, things change. You change. Your nature changes. And we end up being in a world in which, in essence, we really don't belong. But we are called to stay here to serve. And if you've been saved for a long time and worked in the workplace and lived for Christ in the workplace, you will know what I'm talking about. The opposition, the resistance, uh, the, uh, the misunderstandings. You've probably, in sharing Christ, been told, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And to the world it is. But that is the call in place of uh, the fact that we have a principle there throughout Scripture of vulnerability. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Next, please. The principle of dependency. This is one of the things that I have seen in Africa in a greater extent than I've ever seen any place else in the world. For one reason. The people, the pastors that I teach in Africa, they have nothing. They have no wealth. They, they are the only people that I have met that when they bow their heads to pray and give thanks for their food, they ask God to give them the next meal. And in this, we must realize the call to trust God. He says, carry neither purse nor script nor shoes. Salute no man on the way. In other words, trust me to provide for your needs in terms of ministry. I've already mentioned that he's, he's equipped every believer with at least one spiritual gift to serve him. But in the context of serving him, we are totally dependent upon him. Not only for the physical needs, but for uh, the, the spiritual strength. We are totally dependent upon him. I believe that as I travel around in North America uh, sharing with churches, one of the saddest things that I see is the fact that God's people in North America don't need to depend upon God for physical life. I reminded the folks in Africa that I teach occasionally that I probably, we, Kathy and I, have probably have enough food in our freezer to feed the village for a, a month in terms of the diet that they have. They can't comprehend that. They can't imagine that. How could we have so much? They, they think that's an ideal. And when they ask me to pray that they will have much, I say, no. And they look at me strangely and I say, I wouldn't want you to be uh, in a place where so many Christians are in America not dependent upon God. They'd have done great and marvelous things simply because they are dependent upon God. Number three, the principle of urgency, which implies a call to be diligent. He says, greet no one on the road. It sounds like a strange thing. You know, how, how rude can you be? Don't greet anybody on the road. And the, the point that God is trying to make is, is don't be sidetracked. We have to be diligent with the responsibilities that God has given us. You have been given a treasure of being able to serve God by the very gift that he's given us, given you personally. And in that, we have got to let nothing distract us. And yet, it is so easily easy rather to be distracted in this. That's why it is a call to be diligent, to to keep on with this task uh, and, and not be distracted even when it uh, seems to be the thing to do. A challenge for all of us. There are so many distractions. It's probably one of the reasons that today in North America the average attendance in an evangelical church and this includes Canada the average attendance in an evangelical church is less than half its membership. And I mean living membership. That, that's where we're at. So distracted. Number four, the principle of clemency. 
the idea of clemency means to be gentle, to be peaceful. It says in Luke chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, Into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. I remember years ago when I worked for Xerox Corporation, I was on training in Chicago. And Sunday came around, so I got the telephone book out to find out if there was a church close by. I found one according to the address. It wasn't too bad, easy to walk to, five minutes away or so. Got into this little church. Won't give you the denomination. <clears throat> However, it was an evangelical church. And for about one hour, because I was the only guest there, I was beaten and bruised, not physically, but spiritually. Man, that guy thought the pastor not being able to meet me ahead of time because I actually didn't arrive exactly on time. And when I got there, out of the 30 or 40 people there, I was pretty sure I was the only visitor. And I was ushered very close to the front, not front row, that's not kosher. But through the whole sermon, this very genuine, very sincere pastor kept his eye on me and he preached hell and damnation to me. Now, it was a good sermon, but I wonder how many times he'd preached before to some visitor who wasn't saved. Because that really, in my opinion, uh, you know, God does wonderful things, but that was an abusive way of sharing the love of God. And, and we, as God's people, can easily fall into that trap. We're right and everyone else is wrong, so let's get the message out there. Well, that's hardly a peaceful, gentle way of presenting Christ. And in all of our ministries, whatever they may be, we should carry this, this principle of clemency, this principle of, of gentleness, of being peaceful, so that people are attracted to who we are in Christ before they are told of how they can be in Christ. Principle number five, the principle of expectancy. And, and in this, it implies a sense of satisfaction, of contentedness. He says, and in the same house remain eating and drinking, for the labor is worthy of his hire. I don't know how my brothers in, in Africa can find such contentment when they have nothing until I talk to them and find out they have the greatest thing and they know it, Christ. They are without having, with having very few possessions and their greatest um, possession in a sense, their greatest security outside of God is family. And family, basically in the countries that I've taught in Africa, is tribe. And so the whole village is all related. And that is their security. And they share and they care and they love one another. And they have so little, literally so little possessions, yet they are the most contented people I have ever met in the nine countries that I've taught in and, and 11 schools that I've taught in around the world. Totally contented. It amazes me. And, and it reminds me of this principle of serving God that's seen throughout the scriptures where God's people are simply contented with where God has placed them and what God has provided for them. How about you? Are you contented? Number six, the principle of tenacity. To be steadfast, to be persistent. He says, go not from house to house. Uh, uh, to, be, to be flighty is not the way of serving God. Uh, to, to, to be here and be there. We're, we're called upon to be persistent, to hang in there. 
uh, with what God has called us to do. And uh, we praise God and rejoice in a family that's married for 35 years. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, where are we, Kathy? <laughs> we were married in 72. You do the math. <laughs> I better find out real soon because August is our anniversary. And <laughs> uh, but, you know, hanging in there, sticking with it. Uh, no marriage is perfect, including ours. And my wife is very, very patient with me. But I remember coming home one day and finding her reading a book entitled Married to a Difficult Man. <laughs> I tried to find the counterpart, but it's never been written. <laughs> but, you know, she stuck with me and I've stuck with her and, and, and we're praising God for that. But how about serving God? Do you know the fallout rate for serving God is very high? In terms of, I don't know what it is for senior pastors, but in youth pastors in, in America, I don't know the statistics in Canada, but in youth pastoral ministry in the United States, the average length of ministry is two years. That's pretty sad. Now, it's not all the youth pastors' problem. But the point is, there will be times when you serve God, it's going to be tough. It's going to be miserable. It's going to be knock on your head. Some of you are smiling. You've been there. But God says, the principle, stick with it. Uh, don't, don't be running around. Now, in the context here, of course, it's, and I'll share this in a moment, uh, it is unique in the situation of the 70 being sent out because their job was different than your job and my job. But, but the, the principle is the same. God calls you, stick with it. Stick with it until God takes you home. I didn't hear any amens. Number seven, the principle of sensitivity. It implies a call to be courteous, to be yielding, to, to conform without compromise. And in the context here, it has the implications of, of cultural uh, uh, situations. Whoever... whoever Whoever, whatever, sorry, whatsoever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Now, I remember taking this literally in Africa the first time I was given snake and, and uh, grasshoppers and, and other little bugs. And you know what? They were good. I, I would recommend them. But broadening it out into other cultural situations that we encounter, especially in Canada, I still believe from the record that I read or the statistics a few years ago that Canada is the most uh, international, multicultural country in the world. And the world is coming to Canada, and that's another whole plan of evangelism and, and missions that people have now. But we have got to let go of those things that we count so important in terms of our life, in terms of our habits, to reach out, especially to people from other cultures. We may have to step back and do some things that are a little uncomfortable, as long as they're not sin and as long as they're not compromising our walk with God. We've got to do this. We've got to step out and, and, and be different and eat what others eat or... or, or participate in things that others participate in. Uh, it is a, a principle throughout Scripture where God's people, like Paul, who said, I, I, I am everything to everybody that I might win some. And in principle eight, we have this principle of authority whereby I have to just qualify a little bit. You need to make a distinction between individuals that were called upon uh, to serve God in the l lifetime of Jesus Christ when he was on the planet because these 70 were called to reach out to the Jewish people 
and accept Christ as the Messiah. And in the Old Testament, when prophets came and shared the message, they were given signs and wonders and miracles to confirm the authority that they had in God. And it was the same when Christ was on the earth and he sent the 70 out and, and he sent the apostles out. They were given the power to perform miracles and wonders and signs to prove the authority of Jesus Christ. And as I understand scripture, that does not exist today. I do not believe the gifts of healing, wonders, and signs and, uh, are for today. The gift that people have. Does God do miracles, wonders, and signs and heal people? Of course he does. He's not in a box. But the authority that we have is the word of God because it's completed now and the visible expression of that authority as we serve God is the blessings and power he gives us to exercise our spiritual gifts and do what he wants us to do and when you think about it you've probably come to realize there are people in this world that have changed so drastically people that were shy and could never stand up in front of one or two people, let alone an audience. And all of a sudden, by the grace of God, having come to know Christ as their Savior, they're now teaching and preaching uh, um, in front of hundreds and maybe thousands. It, it is the evidence of God working through our spiritual gifts that is the authority evident to people today. And it's there. You can't deny it. Again, I, I go to places in the world and teach where people have had so little education. And I realize education hasn't got anything to do with ministry success. None whatsoever. As God enables and as God uh, gives understanding, uh, the most uneducated person can, can teach and preach and serve with the authority of God's presence. Number nine, the principle of continuity, which implies being confident. Even the very dust of your city, which cleaves on us, we do wipe off against you notwithstanding. Be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come uh, nigh unto you. We have to be confident in what God has called us to do. There is a continuity here in the fact that we are serving a king and he is always with us. We are never alone. Mark that in mind. When you are prompted by the spirit to witness to someone and yet fearful in your heart of doing that recognize you're not standing before that individual alone the Lord himself is with you be confident in what he can do through you and then lastly the principle of accountability which implies a call to be humble now you would say what does accountability have to do with being humble? Well, he says in Luke 10, verses 11 and 12, even the very dust of your city, which cleaves on us, we do wipe off against you. It will be more tolerable in that day for Tyre and Sidon. As these individuals went out, they went out in the power of God, but they also went out in the peace of God. They were his disciples. They had escaped the judgment that is uh, mentioned in this very passage. And in m escaping that judgment and bringing the message of that judgment and salvation from it to people, they are putting greater judgment upon their shoulders. That's the teaching of Scripture. When we share Christ, we've got to be humble enough to remember by the grace of God we deserve that punishment, but we've escaped it. By the grace of God, we're called to share the beauty of salvation, 
But for those who hear and do not accept, there will be greater judgment. Be humble, recognizing the wonder that we have. We come to this passage, a single passage that gives us these ten uh, principles. And going on, to be a child of God prepares us for eternity. And as yet, the blessings are incomprehensible. We have no idea how great heaven will be. Now, we can get glimpses of it from the scripture, but, but in reality, I have no idea, although I've thought about this a lot, what blessing it's going to be when I, for the first time, see Jesus face to face. I weep, when, I weep when we sing about it. I don't know what I'll fall on my face, I suppose. I don't know. But the blessings that we'll have are so great. But to be a servant, if we go on, to be a servant is something that we need to be really aware of because being a servant provides abundant life presently. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. If the Son of God, all-powerful God, is able to give us abundant life, whoa, can you imagine? Well, you should know. If you know the Lord and you're walking with him, you should know what that abundant life is all about. It, it's, there's just nothing better. Nothing better. To be a servant promises all the provision for the present. Paul says this, this way, my God shall supply all your needs. I hope that's the case in your life. Now, there will be some trials. There will be some challenges. There will be some times when you wonder if God's going to deliver. But in his will, he provides everything that we need because he knows what we need. And then, uh, as we see servanthood, it provides the amazing peace in trial. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes understanding, will keep you. I've been there with cancer. I've been there with a stroke. I've been there with a broken back. And I hate to tell you, but in all the scans I've done, I've also got a kidney stone that has to be dealt with. And you know what? I got peace about that. I'm not looking forward to it, but I got peace about it. And then lastly, being a servant of God provides a unique reward in eternity. We see the crowns. We see the blessings. We see the privileges that we have when the Lord himself rewards us. He himself acknowledges the labor we've done. So we come to just a few points of application. Go on with the next one. The call to serve has a motivator. It's new life in Christ. We are changed. And I suggest to you and call you to this question in your own mind. Are you a child of God? Are you conscientiously aware of possessing new life in Jesus Christ? I've talked to a lot of people, especially in America, who believe that they are saved because of a decision they made years ago. But when you press them about a consciousness of being, of knowing God, they really don't have it. How about you? Next, the call to serve has a method of discovery. And if you get anything from this message, get this. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have new life. And now you need to know where God wants you to be to serve him, how to use that spiritual gift, how to complete it. And we do this by a daily, meaningful Bible study and prayer time. I can't tell you how many people in North America I have met that claim to be saved and do not have a daily, 
meaningful Bible study and prayer time. I think I've said this to you before, but I'll say it again. As a pastor for 25 years, I never counseled one person attending our church for any major problem. I mean, yeah, how, how do I deal with my teenage son? <laughs> I couldn't tell them, but I mean, th that's not a major problem, although it could be. Uh, personal relationship problems, uh, these kind of things. I never, ever counseled anyone attending our church that had major problems to come to, that had a meaningful daily Bible study and prayer time. Because God deals with you. God answers your need. God leads you. God is your strength. Where are you? Are you communicating with God? And then lastly, the call to serve, the means of deployment, is to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to talk about being made in the form of God and being a servant. And of course, the end for him was death. Do you humble yourself to serve God unreservedly for God's glory alone? We will close there, but I just challenge you to this thought. The privilege that was expressed in 2 Timothy chapter 4. where Paul, writing Timothy, said this. And it's our prayer that everyone here who knows Christ as Savior could say this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Folks, I challenge you you know him choose to serve him you have the ability you have the gift you have the power you have everything you need don't miss the one of the greatest blessings that God offers you father thank you for this time to share minister in our lives God we're saved to serve I pray that each here would choose to faithfully serve you until we see you face to face. In Christ's name.